Fantastic. So let me give an introduction to Ms. Lois Pace. Um, Lois Pace um, is a leader who has worked on the ground in more than 10 countries, delivering health programs and mobilizing advocates. She serves as the Global Health Council's um, President and Chief Executive and, and Executive Director since December 2016. Lois comes to the role having led and held um, leadership positions in global policy and strategic partnerships at Livestrong Foundation and the American Cancer Society. Additionally, she has worked with Physicians for Human Rights and Catholic Relief Services. Over the course of her career, Lois championed policies for access to essential medicines. She's testified for congressional global health appropriations and launched the Non-Communicable Disease Roundtable under GHC, which convenes organizations representing multiple issues and sectors around shared advocacy goals. She has been recognized by the Union for International Cancer Control as a young leader at their World Can Cancer Summit and has been an invited speaker at high-level forums hosted by the World Health Organization, the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, and other policymaking agencies. Lois holds a bachelor's degree with honors in human biology from Stanford University and a master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health where she was inducted into Delta Omega Society. She's a current member of Interaction and the United Nations Association's Board of Directors and a past member of Phillips Academy Andover Alumni Council. She speaks several languages, including Spanish, as well as some French and Japanese, and has lived in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Everyone, I'd like to welcome Lois Pace to our space today. Hi, Lois. Welcome. Hi, Janelle. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, I'd like to extend my greetings to everyone joining us online. Uh, it's, been, um, it's been nice to be part of the discussion so far. And I appreciate where Dr. Manala left us off uh, getting to the level of World Health Organization. As Janelle said, I focus largely on policy uh, and advocacy. And so um, I guess I see my role at Global Health Council and the role of our network as lifting up uh, the data or statistics and the stories, right? And the personal anecdotes of people like you and the people you serve. I think it's critically important that policymakers all over the world, government leaders, as well as other decision makers like donors, um, heads of corporations, heads of NGOs, truly understand um, the realities on the front line. And so it's our hope that we get those stories right and we ensure that everything Dr. Manala shared, for example, is reflected in the legislation or funding or additional resources and strategies uh, and commitments to which countries agree. So I'll present uh, a few a few sort of case studies, I suppose, uh, in policy and advocacy over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And then as Janelle said, I'd, I'd love to be a part of a broader discussion. But with regards to uh, COVID-19 uh, and gender, I think we, well, I'll say a, a couple of more things before I get into the, into my first slide, but it's given the work we do at GHC, um, uh, this moment is particularly poignant for us. We had been beating the drum about global health security for years, unfortunately. And I think a lot of us might feel as though we were screaming into a void for a long time until now this pandemic has come upon us. And so we, um, I know I feel a great responsibility for ensuring that uh, policymakers are paying attention now. My main audience for these messages tends to be people here in Washington, D.C. where I'm sitting uh, and, and uh, congressional leaders or officials and their staff, as well as members of the White House or the U.S. administration. Um, but we're also active uh, with U.N. bodies and, and we were actually at or virtually attending the World Health Assembly this week. And so our targets also tend to be uh, those leaders uh, at that level. And when we're, as we're reaching out to them, we want to remind them that their actions shouldn't just focus on the response today, but really think about sort of broadening the scope of their response on a couple of levels. Um, and on one hand, we want them to consider sort of this response, recovery, 
and sort of rebuilding or resilience framework. So in other words, it's not only about the immediate uh, or pres presumably urgent needs of today, but sort of the ripple effects uh, and how this will affect communities and individuals tomorrow and in the months and years to come. Uh, and that takes me to the, the other way we want people to kind of think broadly about COVID-19. It's not just about global health security, right, or even public health. Um, but as we're gathered here today, it's about all of these other issues that, of course, we know as public health professionals and champions are core to the work that we do. But not everyone truly understands how health drives uh, economic status or education or, of course, safety and security uh, for individuals and particularly vulnerable uh, people uh, in certain situations. And so that's, that's very much a part of, of, of our mantra um, is, is sort of helping people understand the range of issues and our responsibility for a more holistic and comprehensive approach. So I'll get into the, the first slide or, or scenario I wanted to share, which is um, a set of principles that uh, a group had uh, sort of pulled together. Uh, it's a, a global coalition of sorts that's organized itself around the response to COVID-19 and um, what the responsibility should be of those actors uh, leading the response. And so the next slide will show uh, these eight principles that they have developed. If we go, uh, and, um, and that is, is really outlining this idea first and foremost that people should be top of mind <laughs> in, in their response and their decision making. And that seems rather obvious, but I think for people in charge, often they're, they're mindful of so many other things except the people that they're trying to serve. And so, and we as a community felt first and foremost that people should come first and we wanted to model that. Um, in addition to a number of other important areas, this, uh, this idea of universality is critical. Um, the fact that all treatment, innovation, supplies should be readily available and widely available to people all over the world. I think we've all seen and heard of the challenges with personal protective equipment, for example, and the fact that many frontline healthcare workers, not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the world have been struggling to procure those essential items as they're trying to save lives. And that shouldn't be the case. And we're certainly concerned about what that means for uh, any availability of a vaccine, for example, um, if that's developed in the next year as is hoped. Uh, and so we wanna be sure that people are, are, are mindful uh, of, of issues around equity, including for, for, for women and girls. Um, there are a couple of other principles I wanted to highlight too, just because it has come up already, which is this idea of uh, a proportionate response. You know, what are we doing in terms of clearly evidence-based public health interventions that might be harmful or have unintended consequences? I think this issue of lockdowns has been critically important to examine um, and, and whether or not or how it's affecting certain communities like women um, and, and the risks that they face, as Dr. Manala outlined. And so that's certainly a part of our principles for that reason. And then finally, just by um, way of example, this idea of being future focused and ensuring that, again, we're taking the long view and we're ensuring that any actions um, taken today really um, uh, are most helpful and least harmful for people that, that uh, we're trying to serve. So um, in the next slide, I wanted to uh, highlight a few other mm, ideals uh, or details with regards to these principles, just so you see the call outs to the communities we're focused on today as part of this discussion. Um, again, uh, you'll see a call out to vulnerable and marginalized populations, call outs to women and girls specifically, an emphasis on human rights. Uh, and then finally, this principle basic principle of doing no harm, ultimately. With that, I'll get into um, another way that the advocacy community has been trying to mobilize around COVID-19 and be responsive to uh, the issues or risks faced by certain communities um, like women. Um, I want to um, give credit to the Women in Global Health uh, organization and community. It's a network of 
um, amazing women leaders in global health that was established in 2015, uh, first in partnership with Global Health Council and, and then very much on their own. And they have been going like gangbusters, ensuring that the spotlight remains on uh, the issue of women, particularly uh, at this time. And so they have issued an, uh, a set of asks for our policymakers with regards to, again, how they're viewing or responding to the current crisis. And so those asks, as, uh, as are on your screen now, they are fivefold. Uh, the first is really looking at the importance of including women in decision making and in public discourse. And it seems obvious, but actually, uh, when you look on your television or listen to your radio, often you don't hear voices, um, uh, the voices of, of women. Um, and, and so there's a blind spot there, I think, uh, when it comes to what people hear or the perspectives that are offered um, that, that is missing, which is why women in global health wanted to sort of prioritize this particular ask. Um, the next ask is about really being mindful that the majority of the health workforce is women. And I think Dr. Manalo mentioned this as well. Uh, these, are, these people are on the front lines and the people on the front lines are largely made up of women who are putting themselves in harm's way by, by serving people at risk for affected by COVID-19. So we need to be mindful of that and provide them with safe working conditions and remuneration and, and all of the things that they might be lacking currently as, as critical healthcare workers and responders. Another important component of their asks includes really being cognizant of the fact that now with um, the, the shifts in, in economies and now with lockdowns and people losing access to income, there's a greater demand on unpaid work, which again, largely falls to women, unfortunately, and that creates an additional strain on top of already persistent um, pay gaps um, or economic disadvantages that are faced by this group or population. And so uh, this, we, we've been calling for an acknowledgement of that and a resolution of that discrepancy. Uh, and then finally, I'll point to the data gap and the importance of just capturing this information, ensuring that we are viewing or researching all of these issues from a gender lens, uh, whether, no matter where we are uh, in the response. And then finally, I wanted to sort of end by saying, okay, well, how's this worked out for us, <laughs> right? We, we make all these demands. We, we have all these aspirations as an advocacy community. Has it worked? Um, and I'll, I'll point to the World Health Assembly that did just uh, take place this week. Uh, there uh, were over 190 countries convened as part of that discussion. And there were over 130 who co-sponsored a uh, resolution, the snapshot of which I included on the, the next slide. And, of course, I can I include a link to this in, in the chat box if that's, if that's of interest. But essentially, this was an agreement um, that was adopted by all countries in attendance without any objection, um, that they would be responsive um, to COVID-19 in a responsible fashion. And not only were they focused on kind of the scientific um, or other core public health or emergency um, um, preparedness or action components. Um, but in fact, there was very important language in this resolution about human rights, about um, the importance of being gender responsive, about the ripple effects of that, that COVID-19 could have on existing programs or priorities like immunization and nutrition, food security and the like. And so I think we as a community were very happy um, to see that language and I, I pulled out a few paragraphs in the next slide so that you could have some visibility, visibility, excuse me, into what was agreed. And so there was a recognition of violence against women in particular, in addition to some other areas like hunger. Um, but uh, I, I think it was important that uh, the member states who convened really acknowledge that. Um, in addition, they talked about, again, the fact that uh, much of the workforce is made up of women and, and the importance of having gender responsive um, measures throughout um, their work. Um, finally, in a couple of other areas, uh, in addition to mentioning gender responsiveness, they spoke broadly about just the importance of a, a gender perspective 
and particularly women's participation again in these dialogues and decision making. So we are very happy to, to see that come to fruition. We're hopeful that countries will use this as a rallying cry and, and that we as advocates can hold them accountable um, as a result of these commitments. I'll also mention, although I won't go into detail about it, um, that there's there are also other ways that the community has been trying to uh, communicate, um, again, the broad perspective of COVID-19, including gender issues with policymakers. And so uh, there was also a UN, UN report um, on the effects of COVID-19 uh, on women in particular. And uh, they talk a lot about the shadow pandemic. Um, that's their language or the language that they use. Uh, uh, to describe what's happening with gender-based violence at this time, again, as well articulated by, by Dr. Manala. And they also, uh, that report also speaks to the economic impact um, and the increasing uh, disadvantage that, that women are facing right now. So I, I'll point you to that in closing. And again, just thank you for having me today. Of course, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from you all as, with regards to how we can do our work better and again, serve you and the work that you're doing on the front lines. Thank you again. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm so excited, this is great. Um, and, and I'm excited for a number of reasons. Um, for everyone that's on this call, these have become my two friends. <laughs> and so, and, and I think what's been really interesting is um, being in the global health and development community um, means that on some level you, you do find friends um, as you travel um, and folks that have sort of similar um, sort of uh, conceptual frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that's been really powerful, I think, has been particularly in the last year, there's been, um, you know, that, that a lot of work around civil society, being engaged um, and being part of those conversations. And so recognizing that, right, we talk about 1978 and, you know, we started with this whole idea that primary care, right, primary health care is really the core and the key to addressing the needs uh, so that you've got this feedback loop, you've got community engaged, facilities engaged, systems set up, and there's this, this connectivity. And unfortunately, as we realize and acknowledge, 40 years since, that has not actually been implemented. It's not been done in the way that it was intended. And so what's happened is um, vertical systems and structures set up and then funding gets directed in that way. And so what's happened is over these years, the lack of base and support for community, the lack and base of support for organizations and systems at the community level being really weakened um, and maintained in that weakness. And so I'm really, really happy um, today to really kind of hear from Lois and from um, Dr. Manala in, as we discuss women, as we discuss the gender conversation, because that is core part and parcel um, you know, I believe as, you know, to the answers um, to what we're looking for. So a couple of key things. One, you know, Lois, last year, um, you know, Global Health Council had its annual meeting um, and, and I was happy to be there and I'm glad that the beating of the drum was around community participation mm -hmm. and really community engagement. And that's been the heartthrob of Global Health Action from, from our beginnings. Um, and so I'm glad that part of that was sort of how do we take these high level policies? How do we take what's happening at World Health Assembly and the UN and all of the agencies therein? Right. And how do we ensure that, okay, well, that's great that, that you know, there was enough support to get it there. But then when it gets to the country level and who's being held accountable for this? Like do the folks in the countries even know <laughs> that something was signed you know, somewhere in, 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 in Geneva? Um, that actually has applicability for their lives and their daily living. And so I think this is where forums like this allow for the, cons the, the, cons the collaboration um, and, and the connections to occur, where this is something that says, hey, here's a resolution that was written and was agreed to by your country leaders. So mm -hmm. as a civil society organization, as a health facility, um, as government, um, both at the local level and at the national levels, this is your entry point right, for you, the conversations. This is your entry point for your own advocacy. So I would love Lois to really kind of speak to that and then I'd love to kind of pull back in Leso um, as we begin sort of our discussion um, around these issues. Well, no, I think that's, that's um, it's, it's the right question for us, certainly, Janelle. I mean, we are not doing all this work just to make noise. Um, we wanna make difference. And so um, I think someone asked a, a 
a good question here in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Kenya, one of those countries that signed on and mm -hmm. presumed they were in attendance. If there were, if all, if all yeah. four member states were, were in attendance and adopted this resolution, then I think you can be in touch with the Minister of Health in Kenya and say, yeah. hey, tell me more about this because mm -hmm. it calls on member states to do X, Y, Z. And here is the statement about gender-based violence, or here is the statement about um, dissemination of, in, of innovations and technologies. And here is the statement about addressing hunger or malnutrition. And so I, I, I think absolutely um, this should be used accordingly. Um, and it's the, probably the responsibility ability of organizations like ours to ensure that information is readily available um, to people on the ground who don't have the time or energy or sort of job description to track all closely, um, which is why we do that and try to show up in forums like this and share that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lois. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think this is a dynamic, right? Like I, I can sit in front of a webinar for two hours. I can give that time for my day, but someone who's actually dealing with the day-to-day -day needs um, of, of provision of services or responding to needs within their community because they're the matriarchs or the patriarchs of a community, you know, don't have that time and don't have that interest either um, to sit down and, and wade through all of this. And so I think this is really, really critical for us to be those connector organizations um, where we're able to share that. I know we've got several folks um, on the call and on, on the meeting um, who are part of gender technical working groups in Kenya, um, in, in Uganda, in you know, several countries, at least we know in, in East Africa. Um, and I think this is part of that fodder. This is part of that information that folks can grasp and say, okay, this is important. This is what we use for our advocacy. Um, and then on the practitioner side, Right, we're starting to talk about sort of GBV a bit more specifically. And we have someone from Nigeria who's talking about the work that they're doing with midwives. And they're saying there's lacking of a strong organizational support in many places for mitigating the effects of GBV in a manner that protects the women. And so they were talking about what the legal state has done um, that can be accessed, but they're saying there needs to be some replication um, of good work done. And so I think this is really, really huge. I think one of the things that we do recognize is there's a lot of work done around GBV. There's a lot of work done around gender. Um, the challenge has been no mainstreaming. Um, the challenge has been um, the lack of, of, of consistent monitoring and evaluation metrics, right? The, the converse, and, and, and I think, Leso, you started the conversation, and I use the word Leso, I, I call you Leso, but it's Dr. Munala, <laughs> and I want to make sure I do that, <laughs> because that's important, you know, it, that, that was some time, that was some time, um, and some heartache, so, <laughs> um, but I do want to say this, um, it is really um, a challenge, um, and I appreciate that you started the conversation with your definition because even the definition of gender-based violence um, is different for mm -hmm. different places, different people groups, um, different communities, different facilities. I mean, it's different. So thank you, Dr. Roberts, for sharing that work. I think part of what we can help to do is help to also connect um, and, and highlight some of the good work that's going on, um, because I think it's important to have part of um, those conversations being shared. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've used these terms South-South partnerships, right? Like that's the new thing today. Um, and I'm a bit informal as you guys can tell in how I speak. Um, but I think the reality is there's a lot of this opportunity in your communities to share um, these scenarios. What is working over here versus what is working over there? Um, there are some cultural differences um, but I think if there's a way for us to begin this sharing, that will be helpful. We're part of several networks. Global Health Council is certainly one um, core group. Then there's several others that are doing lots of work trying to pull this together. But I think we do realize um, not everybody has the same access point to the same friends. Um, and so it's actually going to be a good thing to be part of several networks <laughs> so that you get this. So I'll say that, you know, for Global Health Action, we definitely want to be a part of that and helping to highlight and share out that information. Dr. Munala, can you actually respond to, to Dr. Roberts in terms of what she is saying um, about the need for the standardization 
um, that actually protects women when they get into facility. I think you've done a paper on, um, what was the name of the paper? And I love the terminology of it, but you can share that because we've had some, some conversations around that, talking about healthcare facilities and, and, and the impact of women um, there. Yeah, so that paper was, it's titled, um, She's Not a Genuine Client, and it's about commercial sex workers trying to access services um, and health practitioners saying, well, you're not a victim of rape, and so you shouldn't be entitled to um, the services, yet we know that in many cases, in places where commercial sex work is illegal, they're often victims of violence and cannot go through the um, channels of reporting. And so thinking about, um, so in Kenya, they have guidelines for the management of sexual violence, um, which is really great because you, it, it should ensure um, that the survivors are receiving key services. And so if it's referral, if it's um, psychosocial support, um, if it's medical um, support, um, having all those available and stated in the guidelines is helpful for health practitioners, particularly in um, the conditions they work where they're overburdened, um, um, with patients and this and working with survivors of, of gender-based violence is just part of you know the daily work that they do and I saw a question about um, how to get um, police mm -hmm. and medical facilities involved and I think this is the time for mm -hmm. innovation um, because the medical and legal um, linkages to gender-based violence were not necessarily strong mm -hmm. pre-pandemic and so they're strained now as well and so having um, informal ways to get to the women um, I read about um, church groups having you know if you have um, Bible study groups or any regardless of the your religion if there's some kind of um, group associated with that having some sort of check-ins with um, women and girls in those groups um, having um, women who are part of like the table banking cooperatives for example having some sort of check-in there to make sure that people are receiving support if um, they're experiencing violence the example I shared from social media, having influencers involved, you know, mm -hmm. if you purchase, if you ask to purchase this particular item, that's a code for um, let's get you help. Um, and so having those kind of, you know, interventions at um, social um, supermarkets, rather, um, on pharmacies, you know, places that are essential services right now that um, women might access. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we will have to um, rely on during this time. And then having greater collaboration um, between organizations. I think it's usually um, competitive because you're competing for similar funds, but this is the one time um, that collaboration would be key. I, I saw a question about referral. You know, if you have organizations that have better capacity to do um, online counseling and web based counseling, having that knowledge or having some sort of um, collective, like a database with places where, okay, we cannot manage this, but we know this organization that is given counseling services to survivors right now. And awesome. so that's what we'll have to sort of rely on um, to get through this pandemic when people can't access physical spaces or traditional support um, like they did before. I think this point about collaboration, if I can come in, is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, mm -hmm. right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just because I, you know, there are a number of organizations 
that I find, at least in the policy and advocacy space, who are now looking at each other and looking to each other for some mm -hmm. support and mm -hmm. solidarity, um, which is not just important. It's it's a beautiful thing, but it's it's a valuable thing um, because I think we're all finding some connections to each other's causes in a way that we probably should have been doing before now, but I think especially in this moment are recognizing. And so there's a real, you know, um, mutual benefit, I guess is what I'm trying to say, um, in uh, mapping what those, not just, not only existing, but um, sort of additional relationships look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting exercise, I think for those of us in the health community who might not be on the front lines and who have operated in silos mm -hmm. for so long and sort of distance ourselves or our work um, from these very important ancillary issues. So thanks for making that point, Dr. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you know, I mean, this is really hitting it on the nail is that emergency scenarios usually, and this was something we were talking about in our, in our last week's webinar, but emergency scenarios kind of push all that is normative away. Um, there's enough data and, and, and conversation around the negative impacts, right, of just pushing aside what's already there to just get to meet the emergency need, right? Um, because after the fact, the resources from a financial perspective disappear. The resources from a human perspective disappear. The interest around collaboration disappears. All of those things that allowed for everyone to say, well, forget about what we're thinking about yesterday or today, and let's kind of focus in because we've got to save a life. And that's phenomenal to be able to quote, save a life because that's really what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in this context, I think this is an opportunity, right? For all of us, to build longer lasting sustainable okay. partnerships and relationships. And so the group that we've been working with, you know, really kind of a core group of folks in, in East Africa and, and some Southern Africa, really looking at, let's, let's start. I, I know you thought maybe this stakeholder wasn't someone who was a part of your world and you know, they're corrupt and right. And the list goes on, but, <laughs> but perhaps, yeah, perhaps let's think about them a little differently today. Let's, let's try again. You know, not everybody's corrupt, right? Not, not every organization is corrupt. Let's, let's kind of take a step back and let's do a real assessment. Um, and let's get our ducks in order today because COVID-19 can be the example or be the excuse to have conversations that you wouldn't have had before, but you've got to be strategic about them, right? You've got to figure out, we'll talk about COVID-19 because you know we want to continue this conversation around gender equity because that's really our end goal right so gender equality is getting to gender equity addressing gbv is getting to gender equity and so the idea is if we're looking at our end goal saying you know we want to be able to have women being in a position where they're not scared to speak they're not scared to participate um, i've heard conversations i've been in rooms where, you know, in certain places in East Africa, when I ask the question, oh, so <laughs> what's the difference between a leader and someone in authority with, mm -hmm. with no influence, right? Someone who has power, right. but maybe no leadership, maybe not. And, and folks sat there in the room and they're talking and they said, oh, 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 it is like our female parliamentarians, you know, because they have, the, they have the power <laughs> or the authority, but they have no influence. And I, I, I just, I did this and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the reality that true. we're living in. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is some of the realities, right? So if we're talking about someone in high leadership not being seen as a person of influence, what happens to someone at home who is wife and mother mm -hmm. and doesn't have access to a phone? doesn't have access to anyone else, what do we do? So I, I just kind of say that to kind of circle back to sort of where we are and what are some tangible next steps? Um, I think one, we can say, hey, you know, thank you, Global Health Council, for giving us and for advocating on our behalf and alongside us and listening. So we're the biofeedback loop, you know, that we, we all learned. We're gonna be that loop to say, yeah, keep pushing, 
but we're going to take what was done at WHA and bring it down to what's happening in Siaya County, yeah, in Kenya. What's happening in, in Los Angeles, in California? What's happening in different places around the world? And we're going to continue those conversations. You know, Dr. Munala, we talked about, okay, here we've got all of these, the awareness of all of the challenges um, that are occurring right now with GBV. But perhaps we can begin to start collecting some of these successes mm -hmm. um, and begin to kind of put together a report or a white paper or something that we can begin to use to send out to the local leaders as well as the national and international leaders. And that's really where GHA sees ourselves, right? Is kind of helping to be that in-between um, connector. So I wanna say thank you all so much. I mean, this was a short and sweet webinar. The idea is that guys, this is just the beginning. This was just a taste, just a touch. <laughs> we will have more um, in the future, but this will all be recorded and available online. We wanna thank Dr. Munala. I wanna thank um, Lois Pace um, of Global Health Council. Um, I would love you guys to say something before we end so we can kind of wrap this up nicely. Um, but if you have any lasting comments, Lois and, and Dr. Munala, please, please share before we go. And they're shaking their heads. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> you said it well, Janelle. Thank Keep you so much. Keep up the great much. work. <laughs> yes, everyone. Thank you so much. I think this takes us all working from different perspectives to pull this all together. And everyone who joined us, Thank you for participating. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments. If you have additional comments, if you have additional questions, you can email us. Um, you can email me. Um, it's in your registration link, um, jwilliams at globalhealthaction.org, um, or certainly go to our website and, and post that. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Sayonara. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs>